Tom Boley, Chief Market Strategist here at Earnings Beats. Hey, good morning, everybody, and welcome to this Thursday, February 15th, 2024 edition of Trading Places Live. I'm Tom Boley, uh, Chief Market Strategist here. Really looking forward to going through all the action with you today. Appreciate all the folks uh, who have come in and uh, uh, checked us out here at Earnings Beats and uh, enjoy our presentation, the way we look at the market. Um, you don't have to agree with us, but maybe there's some things, little nuggets maybe you can pick up that can help in your trading or maybe in the way you review the market, looking for highs, lows, tops, bottoms, sideways action, whatever it is. Uh, but we're really glad that you're here to join us this morning. Uh, if you do like the program, make sure you hit the like button today. That'll help us. Also, be sure to subscribe to the channel so you don't miss anything from Earnings Beats. Uh, but again, welcome to everyone, those of you who, who are new. And of course, those of you who have been sticking with us for many, many, many years, we certainly appreciate your support and loyalty. All right. Going into Thursday now, end of uh, the first half of the first quarter. This is it, February 15th. Uh, and the reason that is a big deal, if you're new to the show, is historically, the first half of the first quarter tends to be very bullish. The second half of the first quarter, not so much. Uh, since 1971, on the NASDAQ, for instance, first half of the first quarter produces annualized returns over 30%. Second half of the quarter, zero. Uh, since 1971, this next month and a half historically has produced nothing on the NASDAQ. Um, so it's just worth noting. I think it's important because I, a lot of times you'll get many of the growth stocks running before earnings start. You get that pre-earnings run up. And then once earnings come out, you see a lot of gap ups and continuation moves to the upside. And then we get through earnings season. It's like, market takes this big pause and just kind of collects itself. And while, while it's doing that, many stocks do struggle or go sideways. And we just take a period off. I mean, there'll be some stocks that keep going higher, others go down. But by and large, uh, when we look at history, it's telling us that we need to be a little bit more careful after we get past the first 15 days of February. Um, and I've got, you know, we've talked about some uh, signals here recently that, you know, could lead to short term pullback. I'm not expecting anything major. Uh, I've said the S&P 500, I wouldn't be surprised to see 4,800. I mean, after yesterday's rebound and then today's uh, what appears to be a gap up, we got futures up a little bit right now. Um, we'll see, you know, whether or not, uh, you know, we peak here. Uh, on the S&P around the 5,100 level. That's kind of what I think we're going to do. And then I expect maybe we're going to meander a little bit lower. Um, but again, that uh, historical uh, trend that really is uh, bullish this week through today, um, and especially on the small caps, which have been really bouncing back here over the past couple of days, they took it on the chin the hardest on Tuesday with the uh, um, January CPI report out that was hotter than expected. Of course, that could help delay some of those rate uh, decreases or rate cuts by the Fed. And that delay, I think, uh, does impact small caps a little bit more, which is why I think we saw that big sell-off. But 10-year Treasury yield, and we're going to talk about that in just a minute, 10-year Treasury yield went screaming up to the uh, 430 area, maybe a little bit above. Remember we had that resistance at 420? Well, we went through it. Now we're right back at 420 again. So was it a false breakout or are we going to bounce on the 10-year treasury, treasury yield from here? I think that is going to play a big role in whether or not we see any continuing move to the downside in our major indices. Anyway, let's get into it. Let's talk about what happened on Wednesday and what, what maybe we can expect today. Uh, first, the Dow Jones Industrial Average finished up four-tenths of 1%. And as I go across, the riskier uh, the indexes get, the higher they went yesterday, which tells us that there was a lot of growth leading value yesterday in this rebound on the S&P 500, which was nice to see. Again, I'm not sure it lasts, but maybe for a day or two, not bad. But again, Dow Jones up 151 points. That was four-tenths of 1%. S&P 500 rose almost 1%, gaining 47 points. That took us right back up to the 5,000 level. So yes, we had the big down day on Tuesday. All of a sudden, 5,000 was gone. Well, 
Then it wasn't. Now it's back again, back to 5,000 at the close yesterday. The NASDAQ 100 gained 207 points. That was up almost 1.2%. Mid caps up 40. That was 1.44%. And then we had the IWM, which tracks the Russell 2000, gaining 2.3%. So again, the more risk the index had seemed like the better it did yesterday. Transports jumped right about where they needed to at that uh, 50 day moving average. It wasn't a lot, quarter of 1%, but it did uh, move up off of that 50 day moving average, which was good to see. <clears throat> moving on to the sectors. First of all, nine of the 11 sectors were up. I know energy was one that was down and I want to say staples or utilities. One of those was the other one. I think it was staples that was down. Um, but industrials led the action to the upside, gaining one and two thirds percent. We had uh, communication services jumping more than one point or jumping 1.6% and then discretionary up a little bit more than 1%. So we had three of the five aggressive groups leading this move again yesterday back to the upside. And that honestly tells me that, you know, maybe this rally does still have some legs. What I would normally expect is once we get a pullback and a top is set, which I was kind of thinking it was, normally on a rebound, you wouldn't see the aggressive groups back on top. You would see them maybe somewhere in the middle or maybe even lagging, which would be further evidence that we had topped. In this case, we and uh, technology was number four, by the way, I only usually show the top three, but technology, another key component of uh, any bull market advance. Um, also did well yesterday. So the key leaders that we've been watching carry the market to the upside really over the past 15, 16 months. Um, they were at it again yesterday on this rebound, which uh, if you are sticking to the long side, which by the way, I am, you know, I've, I'm, I'm asked all the time, you know, well, if you think the market's going to go down there, do you short it? Do you just go to cash? For me, if I think it's going to be something extended, then I might think about more cash. Um, if I think it's a bear market, if I'm, if I'm literally seeing signs of rotation and everything else that suggests we're going to go a lot lower then yes, I would move much more into cash. I would not short until I get the breakdowns though in price. I'd need to see the moving averages go and, and that sort of thing. That's just my own approach, um, to trading. I stick with the long side. We are in a secular bull market advance. We've been in one. Don't let anybody tell you anything else. Look at the chart. <clears throat> you don't need an analyst telling you we're in a bull market. 52 week, all time highs. Yeah, that's a bull market. Um, but, you know, tops are tops. <clears throat> Excuse me. And if, um, if we are going to go back to the downside, we'll need to see some price confirmation, um, not just a few signals uh, under the surface. But I can tell you most of my signals that are bearish or cautious are very short-term signals. My long-term signals remain bullish, and that's why I'm not giving up my position on the long side. The problem is <clears throat> if you turn more bearish and you get, you know, you, let's say you just move into cash and the market keeps going higher, just like it did yesterday, bounced right back. <clears throat> Look at all these AD lines going straight up across the board. Look at these aggressive groups. Industrials couldn't be much stronger. Um, communication services pulled back a little bit, starting to turn back up. There's discretionary, new highs, couldn't be any stronger. If the market keeps going higher and you move to cash, what do you do a week, two, three weeks from now if the S&P 500 is at 5,200? You just keep sitting it out? Because on, quite honestly, that's what <clears throat> that's the mistake. Hold on one second. <clears throat> Sorry, I think it's that time of the year, starting to get into the, maybe some of the allergies kicking in. But the problem is when you just remain bearish, when you're perma bear, you, you have to have a big collapse after a run up like this just to get back to where you were when you called the collapse in the first place. Um, you know, if you think the market's overpriced on the S&P 500 when it was at 3,500 or 4,000, are you going to jump in when it's at 5,000? No, you're going to uncover every rock out there to try to find support for your position so that you can feel better about missing out on the entire rally. <clears throat> I don't think that's a great way to trade. 
But that's the problem, I think, when you're in a secular bull market is you've got to figure out how to get back in if you're wrong on the short-term pullback. Is it worth it? One of the risks that you have to consider, it's not just the risk of the market going down. If you get into cash, there's the risk of the market continuing to go up. And again, what I'm seeing are short-term signals. This is not a long-term drawn out thing to the downside, in my opinion, based on what I look at. And I know I disagree with a lot of folks out there and I don't care. I look at my signals and I make my calls. I would rather make my calls based on my signals than based on someone else's signals. I can live with mine. So anyway, um, so you just got to be careful there. Moving on, industry groups. Uh, travel and tourism, huge day yesterday, really flaming the uh, uh, industrial group to the upside. Travel and tourism gained 5.65%, easily breaking out above 1,100 and to a new high. This is a very strong group um, and it's continuing. It's making an, yet another breakout. Um, Renewable Energy had a good day yesterday. I've been talking more and more about this group. Um, and I've been talking about maybe the long-term and the fact that it's been beaten up now pretty good for the last several months. Um, I don't know that we've hit bottom, but I do feel like the risk of being on the short side on these stocks is much greater than, than the risk being on the long side. Um, I'm not adamant and convinced that we're just going to shoot higher, but I do think that, I think this group is undervalued and I wouldn't be surprised. Watch the technicals. I mean, like I said, we had a big day yesterday. If that continues, we get through 300. Um, which is only about 1% or 2% away, that's going to put us at the highest level in over a month. And we're going to start seeing a lot of these uh, moving averages begin to flip. You can already see the 20-day moving average starting to turn up. You go back up to that recent high, about 325, 330, you're going to get that 20-day uh, crossing over the 50. It's going to start to look a lot more bullish. And of course, a breakout above 325, in my opinion, sets the bottom. Because you got a you got a low, here's the higher high or the initial high. You've got the a higher low, and you go through 330, and now you're going to have a higher high, and all of a sudden that chart looks like the whole chart's much different. So this is a group that I would continue to watch pretty closely. Um, you know, when you talk about Nvidia and you talk about a lot of these AI stocks, their earnings were explosive. There's some calling this the dot com 2000 dot com bubble. This is nothing like the dot-com bubble. Many of those companies that were trading with you know, $100 billion market caps or whatever they were back then, 50, had no earnings. And some of them didn't even have a whole lot of revenues, to be quite honest. They just had a lot of hype. Look at the earnings on NVIDIA. You know, and I'm hearing a lot about SMCI. Look at the growth in these two companies. The growth is, and the growth rates are absolutely supporting these moves to the upside. Now, the problem with these stocks and any growth stocks is if you go into a recession at some point, your earnings growth contracts. And, you know, growth stocks, which can go crazy to the upside, overvalued, can go the opposite direction once the market starts anticipating even the possibility of a recession, which right now I think the market's saying no way, but that can change. We have to watch the market every day, every week, every month and continue to, re to reassess and try to remain as objective as possible. Right now, money's pouring into growth. That's not what happens right before a recession. Money starts coming out in a big way. So who's to say what the highs are gonna be on Nvidia and SMCI and many of these semiconductor stocks or the internet stocks? We've had you know many of them taking off. Gonna be a lot maybe to, to check out there um, and continue to watch, but you know, I'm not surprised by the complete repricing that we're seeing in that area because of the growth, because of the numbers they posted in earnings and what they're anticipating going forward. You know, in a fairly low interest rate environment, when a company can grow its earnings as fast as some of these companies are growing, their price multiples deserve to be outrageous. Until you start hearing something negative about the companies, or you just see growth stocks in general start taking a hit. These are stocks I'm not going to try and call a top. 
SMCI was up another $50 when I looked this morning, pre-market. I think it closed at 880 and I think it was 930. Might be a thousand by the end of the day today. Things been in a straight up line, but it's a repricing that it's going through. And I quite honestly, I think this is probably a great stock for the future based on the, the volume that's coming in to support this move to the upside. I think there's a lot of Wall Street, big Wall Street money coming in. And when they get all theirs, then you'll hear all the, you know, we're going to raise the, the our uh, uh, target price. You know, they'll only come out 1300 1500 uh, but they're going to get all theirs first. Uh, you can be sure of that. All right. Um, last one, airlines. Airlines, I wanted to mention, it wasn't the third best. It might have been like fourth or fifth, but I like this breakout. So I'm going to pull this chart up so we can take a look at this. Airlines, horrible throughout the summer months, late summer into early fall. But we've rebounded. We had a huge move up. We have had equal highs coming across and rising lows. And yesterday, we actually closed at the highest level since all the way back in the early part of September. So a breakout on airlines, that's only going to help the uh, transports. And we also you know, have had a really strong trucking group, which you can see here, already made the breakout there. Now we're making it on airlines. And of course, the one that's left is railroads, which recently made a breakout as well. So it's kind of easy to get behind the transports when you see all three key areas um, breaking out. And that's good. That's usually a good sign about our economy going forward. I mean, again, if you're looking for a recession ahead, why are transportation stocks breaking out? If you truly believe that the market looks three, six, nine months ahead and all these transport stocks are breaking out? I don't know. I guess uh, look at the market, how you look at it. But to me, it looks like a market that wants to go higher. All right. So S&P 500. Now, I said last week, I thought, or actually earlier this week, when we got the big gap down with the inflation number, I said there was a pretty good chance that we had topped and that this would be the start of a leg to the downside. I mean, first of all, that call gets negated if we put in a new high, obviously. That's not the high if we get another one. So um, that would be the first thing. And, and from a bullish perspective, I wouldn't be shocked. I mean, I haven't tried to call too many tops in this market. Um, and the ones I call, like I said, I'm looking short term. I'm looking maybe three to 5%. I'm not looking 20%. I'm not looking for a bear market. I'm not looking for a correction. 10%, I don't see it. Um, three, 5%, I think that's possible. Um, that would take us on the S&P 500 back down to about 4,800. Um, and I believe between now and March 31st, we'll hit 4,800 or close to it, maybe even a little bit more. But whether or not it's this week, who knows? But just keep in mind, history is telling us that all of a sudden these tailwinds that have been helping us become headwinds. Um, that'll start tomorrow. We've got options expiring tomorrow. And the week after options can also be tough. Worst day of the trading month is usually the day after options. Historically, that's been the case. The day after options expire. Normally, that's a Monday, but Monday the market's closed for President's Day, so it's Tuesday. So you got options expiration, which can be volatile. That's tomorrow, and then you've got next Tuesday, which historically is the worst day of the uh, calendar month, the day after options expiration. So these are days that could kickstart something to the downside. But for me, it's just not taking any excess risk on the long side. And I've been saying that for a while. The, I think the leveraged ETFs, given the risks of even a short-term pullback, I don't like trading them. I, and market can go up. That's fine. I'm going to stick with my IWM, QQQ, and Spider um, and ride it out. Um, and I do have other funds that I trade individual stocks. Um, and I'm probably going to trade on the long side, but I'm going to get in, get out. That's my strategy right now. Nothing. I'm not buying and holding for long periods of time on individual stocks. I'm simply getting out, get, getting in, getting out. Mo many of those trades, I'll show you one in just a minute that I'm considering to, this morning. Um, many of these trades are simply um, based on the earnings. So the earnings come out. If they're good earnings, the stock is in a pretty bullish position or looks good on the chart. Um, these are stocks that I like to buy 
either on gap ups with pullbacks. I like to buy those pullbacks or sometimes it's a sell on news. So a stock looks great on the chart. Maybe it's near a high, comes out with great numbers, beats top line, beats bottom line, maybe even raises guidance and the market sells off. And a lot of times I like to use that morning weakness to get a rebound, especially if AD lines are strong on the individual stocks I'm trading. Um, so anyway, S&P 500, I think right now, short term, it's range bound. Recent high is your top and the low, which, which went right down to the 20 day moving average. That's your short term bottom. We got a hundred point range, maybe just a little bit over that. Which way do we break first? We'll see. Uh, NASDAQ 100, same thing. Exactly the same thing. I don't need to talk about this at all. Closed on the high of the day. AD line breaking out to another new high. IWM. Actually, I'll pull it up over here because I got the, that AD line. So here you can see, even though we set the high here, you can kind of see where the AD line was over when this high was set. Now we're $5 below. And look where the AD line is breaking out. That's telling me that morning weakness can be bought on the IWM, that we're tending to see uh, rallies. Even the day where we had the sell-off Tuesday with the CPI, we didn't close near the high, but we also didn't close on the low. We came up off of that intraday low. So when you've got a stock, an index, a sector, whatever, that has a strong AD line, morning weakness a lot of times for day traders is a great time to think about getting in. Because the AD, a rising AD line tells you that the stock or whatever you're looking at has a history of finishing in the, in the upper half of the trading day's range. So if, you're, if you open on a stock at $20 and you're trading at 19 and a quarter at 1030 and you've got a strong AD line, there's probably a good chance, not a guarantee. Look at it, the rest of the chart and see if you like it. But if you like the chart, you like the stock, you like the earnings report, and it's down in the morning and has a strong AD line, a lot of times that's how I make some pretty good trades intraday. And I get, back, I get out of them by the end of the day because I'm in them a lot of times because of that strong AD line. So end of the day, I have to wait and see if I can get another move to the downside. Why hold? Um, and you have no risk overnight in positions, obviously, if you close them out at the close. Uh, but let's keep moving. <clears throat> so transports. Um, still got a nice trend line holding right off the 50 day moving average, which was nice. That's kind of been where we've been rebounding on transports before. And with all the key groups breaking out, you got to believe that the overall transportation index is probably going to make a breakout, possibly move back toward that July high from last year. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, for those of you who are new to earnings beats, uh, go over to earningsbeats.com. That's my home. A couple things. I was talking about history and how the market performs during different times of the year. I have a free, what I call Boley Trend, market history PDF. You want to learn more about the history of the S&P 500, when history tells us to be bullish, when it tells us to kind of maybe let off the, the gas a little bit, download the free report. It's free. Cost zero. If you find any value in it whatsoever, it's a great deal because cost is zero. Anyway, check that out. Also, um, <clears throat> check out our free Earnings Beats Digest newsletter. Name, email address is all it takes. Hit that subscribe button. We'll get you set up. Three times a week newsletter. It's a simple read, two paragraphs and a chart. So what's the chart of the day for today? Well, I thought what I would do for today is actually I have Akamai. And Akamai has been in this beautiful uptrend for the last year. You can, I, connecting all these lows almost perfectly. This one, not quite. But basically, we've got a really nice trend line right here. And I could probably even take this and drag it. Oops, that didn't work out so well. There we go. And if I drag it, I can kind of establish the upper channel line, which connects this high and this high. 
And you can kind of see we've been kind of working our way toward the bottom of the channel. Even though we've been going up, you can kind of see we're away from the top of the channel, work our way to the bottom of the channel, get back to about the half, you know, midway point. And I just, you know, what you can do here is, well, let's try it again. I mean, I just kind of estimate like a midpoint, like right in there maybe. And then I usually make a dotted line. But you can kind of see how we're trading up near the upper end of the range. And then here we come down, we're trading mostly in the bottom end of the range. So there was already maybe a little bit of deterioration going on in price action, in my opinion. But this, this action yesterday, there's no reason for me to be in this stock anymore. That to me is a game changer. And the thing is, you got new fundamental information. Earnings came out. And so the market is free to reprice a company's market cap based on new earnings information. I mean, I don't know. I didn't look to see yet what Akamai did in terms of its earnings yesterday, whether they beat, whether revenues beat, what maybe they lowered their guidance. I don't know what happened. But that market reaction breaking out of this channel, I mean, why do I want to be in it and hope it gets back into the channel? This is when technical analysis helps you to limit risk. So you're following this channel. You're okay. You're okay. You're okay. You're not okay. So right here that, you know, if I'm still holding it, if I got any kind of a bounce today, anything, give me a couple bucks, 117, 118, whatever, I would take it and run. Um, and I don't know what Akamai is doing in the pre-market, but um, anyway, I just wanted to point that out because you can't just hope that your stock comes back. The reason we use technical analysis is to try to help us remain somewhat objective. We want leaders. We want stocks that are in leading groups. And this is in software, by the way. Software is the leading group. But we want leading stocks within the group. And so if we go back and we look at Akamai, and we pull up a relative chart. This stock topped back in September. I don't know. That might have been where we, I think that's when we kind of moved to the bottom of the channel and then stayed in the bottom half. That We lost relative strength at that time as well. And so Akamai was already giving us a little bit of a warning. And now this just kind of beats us over the head with it. So anyway. Got to remain objective when you see your stock break down. I know you sit there and you say, well, it's 115 today. It was 125 yesterday. Let me get it back to 125. Well, I wish you good luck. I hope it gets to 125. And if it does, I hope you decide maybe it might be worth selling uh, because that's a whole mental game that you're getting into there. To me, it's clear. I got to break down. I get out. All right, I wanted to talk about some uh, earnings because companies are reporting, obviously, still a lot of companies reporting earnings. One company I pulled up that uh, had reported last night, or maybe actually it might have been this morning, Crocs. Um, Crocs, you can see it moved up, kind of been going sideways. We're getting an easy breakout on the open above these tops. I really like Crocs. This is one, if they beat top and bottom line and it gaps up to 114 and we come back down somewhere around 110, 109, because a lot of times that first hour can be extremely volatile. Maybe it goes to 120. If it does, I just let it go. I can maybe get it somewhere down the road. Um, but if it pulls back, this is a stock maybe that I would be interested in. I can tell you one that I am very interested in is Upwork, which is one of our, whoop, now it's come back down. Never mind. Um, because it was 1580 something before we started the show. Now it's 1536. I wanted to bring this one up in particular because I want to show you what I like to see in a, in, a, uh, in a chart in order to trade it. So if you take a look at the tops on Upwork, here is, the, and I look at candle bodies. So I'm looking at opens and closes. That's what makes up the candle body when you see these rectangles. So the highest part of the rectangle, which on a red filled candle is the open, 1565. What about this one right here? 1557. Uh, what about this one here? 1564. Look at this one. We actually got a close. 1566. So that is our highest candle body, 1566. So today, if Upwork opened above 1566, that to me is a bullish sign. So if it had opened at 1567 and it then came back down intraday, maybe to 15, 
20 or 30. I don't know. I'd be watching just to kind of get a feel for the, the action. Um, I would consider taking position, expecting that move back to the upside. Um, we're still sitting pretty close to our high on the AD line, which I like. Um, so any kind of a move to the downside early might interest me if we had gotten the breakout. Now, if we open below 1566 and go through 1566, it's a little bit more questionable. Look at this candle right here. We had the breakout and then we failed and look what happened afterwards. I don't want that. So if you do play a breakout, intraday breakout, just make sure it closes above that breakout level. Anyway, it is 9.30. Let me see if we got an open here yet. There you go, 15.40 already, you know, back to 14.80. I can tell you it did beat both top and bottom line. I don't know about guidance, but top and bottom line upward beat. A um, couple others that uh, looked like they were going to open up strong today. Uh, HUBS, um, it's not even at a five-day high, though. Um, APP, look at that jump. Um, Frog was another one, big gap. And a lot of times when you see these big gaps, you're going to see uh, filled candles early in the trading day. Why? Because when everybody wants to buy and this thing went from 37 to 46, you get a lot of folks that just can't contain themselves. And they're like, I'm going to get in at 46. Unfortunately, you got market makers on the other side happily giving you those shares at 46 because now the stock is down at 44 and change. Um, and then let's take a look at Crocs and then we'll wrap this thing up. Crocs, big gap up. We were looking at 114. It's actually 117, nearly 117 on the open. Now it's back to 114. Anything back down, you know, close to that 112 level over the next 30 minutes, I might start nibbling because I do like this breakout. I, again, I'll go back and double check and make sure the revenues beat. I know the earnings beat. Uh, I'm not positive. I'm pretty sure the revenues beat as well, though. Anyway. That is it for me. Uh, let's take a quick look at the overall market, see how we're doing. We got everything green, a little bit of relative strength again on small caps. Uh, Dow, S&P, NASDAQ just clinging small gains, S and or the uh, small cap index and the mid cap index, both up about eight, nine tenths of 1%. And we got the VIX down a little bit, slightly down to 1432. Um, but that's it for me. Everybody have a great day. And uh, be back next Tuesday for your next Trading Places Live. Have a great day, everybody. Happy trading.